Thank you all for being here. Um, I'm, I'm delighted uh, that you're going to have this opportunity to hear from these wonderful speakers about a really interesting case. Um, so I'm, and, and we have a wonderful audience online. I want to welcome. I'm Christine Haight Farley. I'm a professor here. I teach intellectual property law and co-direct our information justice and intellectual property law program. Um, and we have this series of events, which I just love so much. Um, we have uh, decided that every time the Supreme Court hears an argument in a case about intellectual property or information law or technology law, we invite the litigants to come to the law school at five o'clock to discuss the case. And we select um, some of the amicus brief authors to join us as well. So today was such a day. Um, the Supreme Court heard oral argument in Vidal v. Elster. And I am very excited about the panel of speakers that we have here today. Um, I want to tell you that we have a uniformly sophisticated group of appellate uh, litigators here with us today. Um, each has argued cases before the Supreme Court um, and Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, each has authored Supreme Court briefs um, and each has clerked for a, a, a circuit court or Supreme Court judge. Um, so these, these folks uh, are very intimately familiar with the topic um, that we'll discuss today, and I expect the level of discourse to be very high. Um, so let me first introduce our speakers, and then I'll give you a little bit of background on the case. <clears throat> okay, and I will introduce our three speakers in order that I'm going to turn to them. So I'm going to start with Jonathan Taylor, who is counsel for the respondent, Steve Elster. Um, and he argued the case this morning, and he's still able to talk and think, and that's impressive. Um, John is a principal at Gupta Wessler, where he specializes in Supreme Court and appellate plaintiff side litigation. Uh, after law school, John spent a year at Public Citizen lit uh, Litigation Group on a fellowship. And the reason I pull that fact out will become clear in a minute. Um, our next speaker is Christopher Michelle who submitted an amicus brief on behalf of two clients, the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, FIRE, and the Manhattan Institute in support of respondent, um, Steve Elster. Um, Chris is a partner at Quinn Emanuel, where he co-chairs the firm's national appellate practice. Um, previously, Chris served as an assistant to the uh, Solicitor General. And previous to that, he clerked for Chief Justice Roberts. Um, next, uh, we have, again, back with us, um, who has participated in a number of these panels, um, Paul Levy, who submitted an amicus brief on behalf of Public Citizen in support of Petitioner. Uh, Paul has been a litigator in the Public Citizen Litigation Group for 46 years, um, having specialized in First Amendment cases for the past 20 years. So uh, the only thing that would have made this panel even better is if we had a representative from the government here today, um, but unfortunately that's not possible. Um, so I will maybe on occasion step out of my um, very objective neutral moderator role and um, bring in some of the perspective from the government's arguments um, where, where it is appropriate. So let me tell you about the case, <clears throat> because we have students in the room who, who are not familiar with it, maybe um, some of our audience members online. In 2018, Steve Elster, uh, who I got to meet today, by the way, um, applied for the trademark Trump Too Small. Um, and he applied for this trademark essentially for t-shirts. Uh, the mark was just those words. And the mark was not in use as a trademark, but it was an intent to use mark. Um, the examining attorney cited the Lanham Act, which is the Trademark Act, Section 1052C, and prohibited the registration because under that provision, marks which compromise a name, portrait, or signature of a living individual without their consent cannot be registered. And because of the word Trump, um, this fit that, that provision. Interestingly, the trademark examining attorney 
did not find another ground um, that could have been used to prohibit the registration. And that is that if a mark um, fails to function as a trademark, it can be registered. And this seemed like it was based on the goods. Um, it seemed like it was designed to be kind of the content of the shirt and maybe not uh, the mark for the shirt. Um, in any event, um, Mr. Elster appealed to the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board, which is the appellate body that sits in the trademark office, and that court affirmed the examining, the examining attorney's judgment. Next, Elster appealed to the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, which is the Court of Appeals that hears all cases um, coming out of the USPTO, and that court um, found that this provision unconstitutionally restricted uh, Mr. Elser's speech. Um, the case was lit litigated as a constitutional challenge in an as applied manner, meaning that if the, the argument before that court wasn't that the provision was unconstitutional on its face, but it was unconstitutional as applied by the trademark office and the court of appeals agreed um, with, that, with that argument. So now let me just back up and tell you, give you a little bit uh, more information about this section 1052C or is sometimes referred to as 2C. Um, so again, it prohibits marks that uh, which comprise name, portrait or signature of a living individual without their consent. Um, I'll note that it also um, disallows registration of a trademark of a deceased president. And then it uses this language during the life of his widow, which is a reason to outlaw this, this provision uh, on, on its face. Um, but next case. <laughs> next case. Um, so um, under this provision, um, any um, surname or nickname would constitute a name um, so long as it identifies a particular living person. Um, and it can be comprised within a mark. So you can have a mark that has a lot of words and one of the words might be a name or a surname. Um, so um, here is another uh, trademark that was disallowed under this provision, not at issue in this case, um, but very similar. Um, someone applied for the mark, anyone but tiny hands, those were the words. And then there was an, an illustration that went with it, which was a uh, an orange, oval with a yellow tuft like hair. Um, so that was that would be a mark that didn't use Trump's name, but maybe um, could be seen as a portrait, um, as a portrait of the president, the former president. Um, and so it was disallowed for that reason. Um, so in practice, living persons has come to mean um, people who have uh, some uh, reputation, some publicity, because otherwise we wouldn't be identifying them in the mark. So it really doesn't protect all living people, but protects um, uh, well-known living, living people. Um, and this prohibition applies even where the applied for mark would not cause any consumer confusion where someone might think that the mark is connected with the person. So um, here is a complete hypo. This is not, and nobody applied for this application, yeah. but if someone applied for the application, I'm not Donald Trump, nor do I have his approval, um, that would also be rejected, even though nobody would think it's, it's associated with Trump. Um, and so the idea that um, a mark might be falsely connected with someone, a living person, um, that is prohibited under a different provision in the Trademark Act Act in um, 1052A. Um, so there is a vehicle to deal with that problem, but that's not the problem that this provision deals with. The other thing I want you to know before we launch into this discussion is that this is the third time in the past six years that the Supreme Court has decided whether a provision within the Trademark Act um, uh, is unconstitutional under the First Amendment. So in 2017, in um, Mattal v. Tam, the Supreme Court ruled that a provision that prohibited the registration of disparaging marks was unconstitutional. And then in 2019, um, the Supreme Court ruled in um, uh, Inaku versus Brunetti that a provision that 
uh, prohibited marks that are scandalous and immoral, and immoral or unconstitutional. And in both of those cases, um, that was unconstitutional on its face, not as applied. Okay, so that's the background. And now what I'd like to do is to ask each of the speakers to briefly um, talk about what the what the main points of their argument uh, uh, were to the court, either in brief or in oral argument. And although um, the government was the petitioner in this case and therefore uh, started um, their argument since the government is not here, I'm going to start with the respondent, um, John, on behalf of uh, Mr. Elster. Thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll pick up where you left off. So there was a lot that the court hadn't decided after these two cases jammed into that. The court in both of those cases resolved the question on narrow grounds and said, uh, what's going on here is viewpoint-based discrimination. And because it's viewpoint-based discrimination, we don't have to determine what the right way of analyzing these con you know, constitutional challenges to these kinds of provisions is. And in particular, in Justice Kagan's opinion in Brunetti, she said, there was no majority in, in, in TAM, and there was no majority in that case uh, for resolving the question of whether a restriction on registration under the Lanham Act is best viewed as a condition on the receipt of a, a, a government benefit or a restriction on speech. And that's a pretty thorny question, and it kind of depends on what the baseline is. And so, you know, there are reasonable arguments on, on both sides. Um, and so we tried to pitch the case in a way that, you know, we thought would allow the court to resolve it in our favor in a narrow way, because the court, you know, two times in a row had shown a pension for doing that. And I think, you know, what is unique about this clause, and Chris will get into this a little bit more than I will, is it's, it's not viewpoint based in the same way as the disparaging marks was viewpoint based, because that was like a happy, you know, a happy talk provision that required marks to the extent they wanted to talk about somebody to say good things rather than bad things. This is more peculiar. It's a, a, a prohibition that seems to be a categorical prohibition. You can't use someone's name on a mark unless you have their written consent. And so that's an express exception built into it. And the way you know that works in the real world is nobody's going to give consent to a you know, mark that criticizes them. And so there's a kind of viewpoint based effect that this has. Um, and I'll just give you a couple of examples so you know how this works in practice. So we give a few in our brief. Um, uh, Biden president was accepted for federal registration. Impeach 46 was denied. Joe 2020 registered, not no Joe in 2024. Hillary for America approved, but Hillary for prison, prison 2016 denied. Um, and I, I think I'll just give you a few more so you can understand the stakes. If you're organizing a rally and you want to brand it as Obamacare National Day of Protest, you'll be singled out for second class status because as the PTO put it in the real case, your application does not include the written consent of Barack Obama. Or if you're a political advocacy group who wants to call yourself the Never Trump Project, you might, might have to change your name to something like the Lincoln Project, which the government deems acceptable because Mary Todd is dead. And if you're Steve Ulster, who is my client in this case, and you want to have Random House publish a book series, so Trump too small in immigration, Trump too small in the environment, and so on, you'd have to change the title of your book to receive equal treatment. And so I think from our perspective, we thought that this clause just really couldn't be justified. It was a provision that really was unlike most of the other provisions in the Lanham Act, all of those provisions get at kind of the core concerns of trademark law, ensuring that marks function as marks, ensuring that they don't confuse or mislead consumers. And in that way, they really just track the substantive law of trademark. But this provision is different because its only practical effect is to target non-misleading, non-confusing speech about famous people. And to the extent that that's a problem, it's a problem for some reason that's wholly disconnected from the trademark registration system. And so the, the pitch we tried to make, we, we had a little bit more of an aggressive pitch in our brief. And th the way things work is you, you know, you write the, <laughs> the briefs one way and you, know, you, you make you know, your most aggressive argument and then you have some moots and you need, you need to adopt the, the narrowest uh, uh, provision. So 
our position. And so basically where this ended up for us is the government was defending the law on the ground that because it was not viewpoint-based in a strict sense, that it only needed to satisfy rational basis review and that any recognizable form of First Amendment scrutiny. And so we regarded our goal as being to try to convince the court that you've got to apply some kind of heightened scrutiny. And the government made no effort to show why this particular provision could satisfy any sort of close assessment from a court. Um, and so what I tried to focus on today were really three arguments. The first argument was, uh, yes, the government doesn't have to provide you know, the rights and benefits of registration. And those are potent rights and benefits. It's the reason why people go through the trouble of registering and pay attorney fees and pay hundreds of dollars in registration fees. And the whole system depends on everybody having an incentive to register. Yes, the government doesn't have to do that. But if the, the system is set up so that people who have valid trademarks are generally able to get registration if they're willing to pay the fee, and then the government tries to selectively withhold those generally available rights and benefits to certain people based on the speech that they want to engage in, then that's a content-based burden on speech that should require intermediate scrutiny. And you know, from my perspective, the court shouldn't be so afraid of adopting an approach that would require intermediate scrutiny because the vast majority of these provisions just track the common law of trademarks and they're consistent with the First Amendment in the, in the same way that trademark law is consistent with the, the First Amendment. It's designed primarily to get at confusing or misleading commercial speech. But the second argument we had, which I, I, you know, I was hoping it would gain maybe a little bit more traction with a couple of the justices, is that at least in this context, when you have a provision like this that is trying to do something that's totally outside um, you know, the trademark system, which is to try to pr protect kind of the dignity interests of famous people so that they're not gonna have to sort of see t-shirts with their names on it with, that they don't like or have their names associated with commercial <laughs> products that they don't like. Um, you know, that, that, that harm really has nothing to do with trademark law. And when you have, um, when Congress is trying to leverage the trademark system and the rights and benefits that attend registration to get at some other purpose, that that kind of leveraging uh, warrants some scrutiny. Um, and, you know, the, the cases here are a little bit murky, but it, it's analogous to a kind of, um, you know, a, a condition on the receipt of federal funds where Congress is trying to attach restrictions on the use of funds that get outside the program. And even in the context of, of government funding, where government has a lot more leeway, uh, and even in the context of cases where, you know, the restrictions are related to the program, the court has invalidated certain restrictions as, as being, um, you know, unconstitutional conditions on the receipt of funds. And by analogy, if Congress is trying to impose uh, barriers to registration for reasons that have nothing to do with why trademark law exists, and, and in fact, really is contrary to the whole purpose of the registration system, which is just to register all the marks that are actually in use so that people can go there and they have a full account of what's already taken, and that ensures that people will not be confused, then the least the government can do is, is justified under some form of scrutiny. It cannot be that it's rational basis review that gets it backwards. And then the, the final point we made is even if those two, you know, the combination of those two arguments were not enough, then you know, the, the kicker here is you've got this express speaker-based limit uh, uh, discrimination that lends itself to viewpoint discrimination. And even if that's not in and of itself a reason to invalidate the statute, the effects are troubling enough that the court shouldn't relax its guard and apply rational basis review. It's another reason to apply some form of scrutiny. And then because the government made no real effort to defend the law under scrutiny, we thought that if we could just win that methodological fight, we could prevail. Um, but I'll just say in candor, I didn't see as, <laughs> as many uh, takers up there as I thought I, I might from the bench. We'll see. Sometimes, you know, argument is a poor guide to the, you know, the, the way the opinion is up shaking out. Um, and I think here, you know, it, it's actually harder to write an opinion on the other side in some ways. Uh, you know, and, and, and some of the, the questions from the justices seem to be sort of getting at this because, 
they didn't necessarily like, at least a few of the justices didn't necessarily like the arguments that the government had put forth, but they wanted to find a way to kind of up, up maybe uphold the statute, which would apply to them as famous people. <laughs> so um, I don't know, I don't, I'm sorry to dominate, but that was the basic kind of narrow pitch that we tried to make and we'll see what happens. But. That's great, thank you very much. Chris, tell us about why you decided to file a brief in this case and what you said. Sure, happy to do that, and thanks for having me. Um, I, I can't help but start by first saying congratulations uh, to John for uh, for making the argument today uh, and for making it to this panel. I've, I've argued a number of cases in the court, and I can tell you under no circumstances would I make it to a five o'clock panel uh, later that day. So uh, hats off to him uh, for both the argument and for being here. Um, I got to file an amicus brief in this case um, for two great clients. Um, uh, as Professor Farley mentioned, FIRE uh, and the Manhattan Institute, they're two clients, uh, two organizations that um, get involved a lot in First Amendment and, and other cases. Um, you know, one of the things I like about them is that um, they tend to not necessarily fall into one particular ideological category. They, they um, stand for the First Amendment and their principles kind of no matter um, whose ox is gored, uh, so to speak, in a particular case. And so in this case, um, they were very, and I should also, I should say at the outset, I'm, I'm you know, speaking for myself at this panel, I'll talk a lot about um, the brief that, that I filed on behalf of them, but uh, I'm just speaking for me. Um, you know, the, picking up with the Tam and Brunetti cases that Professor Farley and uh, and John talked about, and in both of those cases, the court held, and in, in, in Tam held unanimously, uh, that particular trademark registration bars were viewpoint based or were engaged in viewpoint discrimination. Uh, so the core of our argument in our amicus brief was that this trademark registration bar was also viewpoint discriminatory in operation. You know, we acknowledged that it's not um, viewpoint discriminatory on its face in the same way that the bars at issue in the Tam and Brunetti cases were, but that uh, in practice, uh, it has a viewpoint discriminatory effect. And it's not very hard to see why. Remember, this: the uh, nature of the provision is that um, it bars registration of a trademark that uses a living person's name without that person's consent. Uh, and so it's pretty easy to see that uh, the named person uh, is much more likely to consent if the message in the trademark is positive than if the message in the trademark is negative. And uh, although it's certainly not true that the, that uh, somebody will always consent to a positive trademark, it does seem to be true that nobody uh, consents to a negative trademark, or at least uh, neither the government nor anybody else uh, in the process that I found had an example of that. So it does operate as a one-way ratchet, albeit, uh, you know, not, not 100% of the time. Um, and so that was kind of the, the, the core of our argument was that the, the same ultimate principles that led the court to strike down the provisions at issue in Tam and Brunetti should also uh, lead it to strike down the provision at issue here. And an important part of that argument, and John touched on this, I think, at the argument today, um, uh, was that there are other uh, provisions in the trademark law in this section 1052 or section two of uh, the Lanham Act that prohibit the registration of trademarks that are um, uh, misleading or create a false association or are deceptive. And so you might say, well, one reason for this name clause is that uh, it's going to confuse people if somebody else registers a trademark that includes a, a third party's name. But if that's the case, there are already other provisions that take care of that. So again, in practice, what this names clause ends up doing is just prohibit, just empowering the named party to essentially veto trademark registration that they don't like while, you know, allowing or not allowing uh, trademark registrations that they do like or, or have no opinion on, um, which does certainly seem like viewpoint discriminatory uh, in, in practice. Um, and, you know, a, a related point we made was that um, in order for this uh, clause to actually apply to somebody, they usually have to be a public figure. They at least have to be recognizable enough that the use of their name and the trademark would mean something to, um, to the public. Uh, and so th the ultimate um, regime that you have structured, you know, the, the, the ultimate system that's created by the statute is that public figures and, and mostly public figures alone are able to veto uh, the registration of trademarks 
products that they don't like. Uh, and really, that seems to turn the First Amendment upside down, because in almost every other context, public figures have the least protection from the First Amendment, precisely because uh, they enter public life, and, uh, and with it comes a willingness to accept certain criticism, and they're also equipped with a platform to respond to criticism that uh, their private figures are not. So allowing this provision um, to empower public figures in that way really does seem uh, at odds with a lot of the court's other First Amendment jurisprudence and, and frankly at odds with the with the purposes of the First Amendment itself. Um, so that was that was our argument in the case. Um, you know, it was not, I should add, uh, we'll get to this more as we get to the argument, get into the uh, discussion of the argument today. This was not the basis that the federal circuit relied on in invalidating the statute. Um, it relied on um, uh, the argument. So John was was talking about the fact that the statute doesn't survive the requisite level of scrutiny. Uh, and so there was a, a background question in this case about whether the viewpoint discrimination argument was really before the courts, uh, given that the federal circuit hadn't relied on it uh, and, you know, hadn't been a major focus of a major focus of the party's briefing, how, how much of a focus it was and, and whether it was really before the court um, was, I think, in the background, but that, that could explain in part why it didn't play a greater um, role in the argument uh, itself. So I'll stop there and uh, hear from everybody else. Thank you. Huh. So our interest in the case stems from the litigation that I and indeed some of John's uh, partners uh, while they were at the litigation group uh, and they have been engaged for the past 20 odd years uh, trying to prevent the use of trademarks, whether they be trademarks for uh, companies such as Walmart uh, or trademarks for individuals such as, for example, Bernie, in one case, uh, in situations in which I was involved, to prevent people from expressing their views about the uh, trademark holders um, yeah, on message t-shirts and other forms of communication. And we've argued in a series of cases uh, that the use of trademarks to suppress what is essentially political speech, even if it's, if it's political speech that's sold on a t-shirt, is beyond the purview of the trademark laws. Uh, and we've made that argument in a number of cases. We made it last term in Jack Daniels. And uh, our filing in this case was an opportunity to toot that horn again. Uh, and a significant part of our brief was uh, devoted to the proposition that trademark law is not properly applied uh, to suppress uh, political speech. But what interested me about this case in particular, um, and this is, I would say, the second part of the amicus brief that we filed, is that there's a real air of unreality about this case. Uh, John mentions that Elster filed his trademark application in 2018, claiming, I suppose he made the statement, uh, I don't know whether he makes it under oath or whether he, but he's certainly making a statement to the government that he has an intent to use this mark on t-shirts. And five years later, as far as I know, he has not used the mark on t-shirts. Um, does he really intend to use the mark on t-shirts? And if he does, why is he seeking a trademark? He doesn't need the trademark to sell the t-shirts. Everybody seems to concede that. The only reason you would, there are, I think, two reasons um, that you would want to seek a trademark in this term. One is because you either want to uh, prevent other people from using the slogan on t-shirts, or you, hey, I had this great idea. If somebody else wants to use my great idea, they have to pay me a license fee. They have to pay me rents for expressing their political views. And both of those seem to us to be totally inappropriate. The other possibility, and uh, you know, I wish Mr. Elster were here because I would ask him this question, but instead, I guess I'm going to ask his lawyer 
I have to wonder whether this case was filed as a test case in order to bring a claim against the statute. Um, you know, there are a lot of really great arguments made about the constitutionality of the statute. I and mean, John is a terrific lawyer. He does a great job of manipulating the legal doctrines in order to make the arguments. But is, does Elson really intend to sell these t-shirts or is this just a test case in order to bring a challenge to this particular provision uh, and as applied challenge to this particular uh, uh, statute. Um, so we have concern, we didn't articulate the latter concern in our brief, but uh, that's certainly a concern that's in the back of my mind. Um, but we are concerned about the real world effects of allowing trademarks like this. Uh, in the domain name context, which is a different registration system, all you have to do is pick a domain name. You don't have to justify it. You pay a fee, you pick a domain name, and you prevent other people from using the similar domain name. So we gave the example of Verizon. Now, when Verizon was first created, it was a backroom naming activity. Nobody knew that Verizon was going to be a trademark. But before they actually announced their new name, they registered a series of trademarks, including VerizonSucks.com. Now, why did they register VerizonSucks.com? They didn't intend to have any website called VerizonSucks.com. They registered it so nobody else could have it. Donald Trump has a shitload of domain name registrations including a lot of negative domain name registrations, which are plainly intended to block people from using those domain names to criticize. So now he doesn't, he hasn't registered a series of negative trademarks about himself, but if John were to win this case, you can bet your bottom dollar he would start doing this only to make it more difficult, more prohibitive for people to try to use this slogan on their own t-shirt. So that I think is a real world concern about the impact of creating a regime in which it's possible to have a trademark in a political slogan criticizing a public freedom. Now, it was a very interesting, since we were originally gonna talk about only the briefs, but since the argument has been discussed, there was a really interesting exchange. Jump in the gun. Well, all right. <laughs> I mean, you know, the, the possible block to registering a mark like this, to which John alluded in response to a question at oral argument, and which to which a number of people have referred in the commentary, is that a political slogan fails to function as a trademark. But I'm trying to imagine. A political slogan attacking a public figure which would function as a trademark and therefore would be registrable. And if we, and maybe in John Wood Courts, we thought that issue came up and he came up with a possible example of that. But if it's not possible to think of a trademark that can be registered, uh, well, sorry, what? I have an example. Okay, uh, on failure of function grounds, then what's the whole point of this attack on the statute? I mean, it's just, it seems to me that to a large extent, the failure of function doctrine and the rule against registering negative domain names may sort of be uh, complementary images of the same problem. So here's my example, and it was brought up in a other panel we were on. Slick Willie for condoms during uh, President Clinton's uh, administration. So it, it was actually a legitimate business, um, maybe that it was more gimmick than, than actual product, but I think it was, it, it probably had less of, if, if in fact, no failure to function issue. It was also inherently a, a critique of Clinton. Um, well, let me, let me, I'll give the ex examples I gave earlier. So the Women's March has been registered. Uh, Obamacare National Day of Protest was not registered. That feels like you know, you're branding your political rally and you might have merchandise with that. You might, you want to invest in that message. You want to broadcast it to people. That's an example. Lincoln Project, registered trademark, never Trump Project would not be. If that's the name of your or political advocacy organization, I don't see why that wouldn't function as a trademark there. 
if my client published a series of books with Random House, Trump Too Small on the Environment, Trump Too Small on you know, uh, Immigration and Down the Line, that's a book series. We know book series can be trademarked like Chicken Soup for the Soul. How would it not function as a trademark there? So it's a distinct problem. And the point we were trying to make is to the extent that your concern is ensuring that marks in fact function like marks, there's a separate requirement that you have to clear that deals with that. And then the only work that this statute has that we're challenging is getting after marks that function as marks that are not misleading, that are not likely to confuse, that don't raise any of the concerns uh, uh, of trademark law. They're getting at something else. And the question I would put to you is, why do you think that has a valid function? Why do you think the government should be able to do that without justifying it? And all you need to say is rational basis. What, what purpose you is it? We didn't address your arguments about the constitutionality of the statute. What we addressed was the real world impact of registering. And of course, you didn't seek this mark in order to have a series of book titles. You sought the mark to put on t-shirts. Well, if it's a rational basis, and you defended it in your brief as this statute discriminates against negative speech because it prevents, and it is designed effectively, I think you argue, to prevent uh, speech which criticizes a public figure. While, I mean, one of the examples you just gave was Obamacare, for example, which is not critical speech. So there, are, there are, and Malcolm Stewart, I thought, had a number of good examples in his argument today about, and also reflected uh, in the blue brief uh, and in uh, the reply brief of uh, trademarks using a person's name in a relatively positive sense, which to which a personal might well not consent because the person is concerned that they would impute a relationship. And although you can argue that, well, such a mark perhaps might be subject to rejection because it causes a likelihood of confusion, what this statute does is provide a much simpler way of getting rid of those um, without uh, sort of a case-by-case -case analysis of how the mark would function in, in practice. It's, it's certainly easier to apply, I agree. <laughs> so um, let me just say in the interest of time, um, the, the government um, made three, to reduce it simply to three arguments, um, that the statute is viewpoint neutral. I think we've, we've covered viewpoint neutrality enough in, in our limited time. Um, that the uh, statute um, that that uh, holding the provision unconstitutional would in fact reduce political speech, and that is basically what what you've explained to us um, in your brief. And um, the first argument and the leading argument um, that the government says is that um, this is not a burden on speech. Um, this is a a government benefit. And as a government benefit, there's this whole program, we will register your marks, we will put you on the registry, you have to comply with our conditions. Um, this, is, this is better looked at as a condition rather than a, a burden on speech. And um, I want to raise that and, and ask you all about that because um, the, the government argued that in, in one form or another, in hand and in Brunetti and in the briefs in this case, and then in their oral argument, and then um, when the justices started asking questions, um, uh, Justices Alito, Thomas, Gorsuch, and Kavanaugh definitely um, said, what else do you have? We don't like that argument. Um, and there were others who seemed to question it um, as well. So I would like to know what you all think about um, let's say, sorry, John, let's say um, the justices want to find a way to find this statute constitutional. Um, what is the what would be their route to get there, assuming that they don't like this this argument that the, the government uh, keeps advancing? That's probably an unfair question. For you. <laughs> 
Well, I'll take a first shot at it. Um, although it was, I will say, not to, not to fight the premise of the question, it, is, it wasn't totally clear to me that the court um, will not accept this benefits argument at the end of the day. But I do agree that, um, you know, four justices, three of whom are still on the court, did squarely reject it in TAM. Uh, and there was kind of a funny moment at the argument where Justice Alito said, you know, look, there's no secrets here. I've already told you what I think about this. And like, you don't have my vote. Uh, But then he said, maybe somewhat ominously for John, uh, you don't need my vote to win this case, uh, which led me to think maybe he knows something about what his colleagues think. And it's not not so good for... um, for Mr. Elster, uh, but but I uh, you know so it, it's not inconceivable to me that there could be five votes for that position. But I, I also totally agree with Professor Farley that the court did not seem uh, totally comfortable with it either. You know there was an interesting argument floated uh, by Judge Gorsuch, I think most prominently, and and and. Um, grabbed onto to some extent by some of the other justices that um, there's a historical basis in common law, in, in the common law and the law of trademark um, for uh, for this name, either for this name provision generally, or at least for um, I an think, exclusion like this. Not yeah. so specifically, I think more generally yeah. um, content restrictions. Yeah, and, the, and Justice Alito, again, at, you know, at one point seemed to say, I have some, an idea of another argument that I think I would accept, but it's not the argument the government is making. He almost asked in a, a sort of riddle-like way, like, what, what if I have something in mind that you're not that you're not arguing? And I can imagine uh, my friend Malcolm Stewart, uh, you know, was thinking, well, what exactly is that uh, that, that you have in mind? And it's, it seemed to me to be something along the lines of a, a, a sort of, um, you know, a, proprietary right in somebody's name. I think he said later in the argument, he was sort of um, hinting at that, uh, you know, in, in the way that some states have a, you know, a, 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 um, a dignitary interest and a proprietary interest in your own name. Again, that would be sort of a common law-like argument. Um, so my, my best guess is would be something like that. It could also be a combination of some justices who embrace the benefits argument, some justices who embrace this historical or common law argument, and together they make you know enough votes for um, uh, for the court to resolve the case. But but I, I I'm not sure I have a, a great answer to that. I'm curious what others so, think. The reversal might be. Um, now, the right of publicity, which is what we're talking about here, is not trademark law, but it is a cognate of trademark law, um, uh, extending in most jurisdictions, particularly only to commercial uses of the name. So, maybe not entirely in every jurisdiction. Uh, I thought John has a fair point uh, made to some extent in argument that that tendency is not altogether in uh, concert with the purpose of a registration system. But, you know, it's quite possible for statutes to have multiple purposes and there's nothing impermissible about that. And so if they were to sort of schlep the um, the dignitary interest represented by the right of publicity uh, into the generally understood purposes of the copyright law, um, I think you, know, you could I, I think you could probably write an opinion that says that. Uh, um, and that would be uh, another ground on which a John's client could lose. Well, let's assume something like this is is the basis for um, being solicitous of this uh, provision. What is the... um, And and I should emphasize that I don't speak for public citizen here. Of course, of course. Um, What what is the... And there was was a bit of discussion about this in, in the questions. What is the level of scrutiny what is the test that the government will be held to in terms of their purpose? And, and you've had a lot to say about that. Yeah, well, I, I mean, this is what I'll be sort of interested mm-hmm. in, in seeing in the court's opinion, because the government, as I understand it, if if the court is to apply anything resembling First Amendment scrutiny, there is some 
even modest, but some burden that you put on the government to try and articulate a justification and so why, show why the fit is appropriate. Um, and the government has made very little attempt to do that here. It's effectively put all of its eggs in a different basket, which is arguing for a rational basis review. And in rational basis review, you don't need to do much at all. And um, I could see some of the justices sort of struggling to figure out whether it is something like rational basis or something more like a, a kind of in-between uh, level of scrutiny that isn't quite intermediate scrutiny, but isn't rational basis. And it's a reasonableness test, but it's a reasonableness test, like Paul was, was saying, that kind of maybe is a little more accommodating um, and it allows Congress to kind of um, uh, take into account not just the purposes of trademark registration narrowly, but maybe trademark-like concerns. I don't know. Um, but I, you know, I think when it comes down to actually writing the opinion, you know, it's one thing to use for oral argument, but it's another to actually write an opinion mm -hmm. that, that that tries to spell this out. And if you're thinking about the ramifications for copyright, which is something that came up today, and you say, well, this is just a government benefit that can be withheld uh, without any real justification, you know, um, uh, so long as it's rational. And that's the, the end of the matter, as long as it's not strictly viewpoint neutral. I'm sorry, strictly viewpoint based. Um, I, I don't know that that's going to command a majority of the court. And so then you have to, you're in a different place where you're sort of working out a, a, a new test, basically, a new kind of flexible test um, that is simply trademark registration system. <laughs> and, I'll for this train and this train. Yeah. Um, and, and maybe it's, you know, designed to sort of uh, uh, shut off future future challenges in this area. But I don't look, I, I don't know what the court will do, but I think that's the most, I mean, it was the question that was unresolved in Hammond Brunetti reading between the lines. I think it may have been unresolved for a reason. Um, and, you know, it's not clear that it'll be fully resolved mm -hmm. by a majority of the court, even with this opinion, mm -hmm. even if they can agree on the judgment. Mm -hmm. um, and so we'll just have to see, but I, you know, we really thought that if we could just take down the argument that it should be rational basis or something like rational basis, and if we're in kind of middle tier scrutiny land, that we should prevail. Um, but we'll have to find out. So I tried to focus on that was the main target today, and we'll see if it made any headway. But did you want to speak to that question? Well, you know, I, only to say, you know, one of the reasons um, that we emphasized the viewpoint discrimination argument um, as much as we did was that it allows the court to get around this uh, this authority question. And again, I think Justice Alito, both in his um, TAM opinion and at the argument today, said this is a notoriously difficult area of law, the notion of um, unconstitutional conditions or conditions on benefits. Um, and, you know, the, the the court, even though in, in hindsight, it looks obvious that Tam and Brunetti, you know, were viewpoint discriminatory provisions. There were serious arguments in that case that uh, in the, both of those cases that they were not actually viewpoint discrimination and that it, it took a relatively capacious understanding of viewpoint discrimination to fit them into mm -hmm. the court's doctrine. Um, so that was, you know, I, I think an I, I hoped would be an attractive part of our position as it would allow the court to get around this um, difficulty. Um, and there were a few questions about viewpoint discrimination, mm -hmm. but um, but but not all that many for whatever reason. So uh, so maybe they are finally ready to, to take it on. So if if you prevail, thank you for not asking if I have a view on that. Oh, I'm so sorry. I don't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I thought <laughs> maybe the brief in the top. Yeah. Oh, I'll see if I can find you. Go ahead. <laughs> so let's say, John, you prevail on convincing the court that it should be intermediate scrutiny. I was really interested in your argument about um, what the government would need to say to justify um, this provision. And you said it here initially that um, the, that that trademark law has a, a very narrow set of purposes. Um, and they include um, making sure that the thing that we're going to allow to be registered functions as a mark. And so we have provisions within section two that, that, that get rid of things that don't function as a mark for one, either they're, they're functional, they're descriptive, um, or 
Um, the other purpose, the main purpose of the Trademark Act is to perfect, um, prevent consumer confusion and deception in the marketplace. And I think that argument, the last time the Supreme Court has spoken about trademark law was the Jack Daniels case and the majority opinion seem to suggest that trademark law has a narrow set of purposes and, and, and it, it agreed with you um, to that extent. I'm curious though, whether um, all that the government can do in regulating the registration of trademarks is so very limited. So I think there are other things in section two that go a little bit beyond that. And I was interested that when Justice Gorsuch was talking about this long tradition and, and, and someone else, maybe the, the chief justice said, well, it can't be unconstitutional if it's been a part of our law for so long, which I thought, hmm, that's different from what you said before. But um, we don't allow you to register a mark that, that has within the mark at all a flag, not because it's confusing, not because it can't function as a mark, um, but because of kind of international relations. And that's been a part of our law since 1905. And that's mandated to be a part of our law based on international treaties. So I think, there's, I think there is a bit of history of trademark law where the government does do more work in the form of the trademark office reviewing trademark applications than just those core things. Um, but at the same time, I think you know, maybe that's, that's your, your, your winning argument. And I, and, I, and I heard you go back to that uh, today. Do you think that, what, what gives you hope that the, the justices of the court might agree that there's this, they would have to start by saying there's this intermediate scrutiny and this falls short for that, for that reason. Well, I, I, I think that even if the court were to adopt, adopt um, a, a test that is even more lenient than intermediate scrutiny, a kind of reasonableness test drawn from limited public forum cases where you know, the government sets up a forum that's you know, designed to achieve, you know, to allow for speech on a certain topic and restrictions based on content are perfectly permissible in that context as long as they're reasonable in light of the purpose of the forum. And so by analogy, if the court were to do something similar here, it would be restrictions on registering trademarks are, you know, even though they're content-based or speaker-based, they are constitutional as long as they're reasonable in light of the purpose of trademark law and trademark registration. And that begs the question of what are those purposes and should we, should we look at those purposes sort of narrowly, or can we can we have a sort of fuller view of them? And you know, we tried to focus on what the court said in the Jack Daniels case. You know, these trademark uh, laws primarily concerned with the two things you mentioned: ensuring that marks serve as source identifiers and ensuring that people are not likely to be confused or misled. Misled uh, as to source, um, and I think so long as trademark law has that kind of you know, maybe it's sort of a, a narrow focus, maybe it's not, but it's a certain traditional focus that it's perfectly consistent with the First Amendment, both for historical reasons and for the basic reason that false or confusing uh, commercial speech is not protected. And so, you know, I, I think that the registration system meant to do its work. I mean, what Congress was trying to do, I think, in establishing it is it didn't believe it had the power to actually um, require people to register or regulate uh, the, the, the use of these marks at the time. And so it was gonna set up a voluntary registration system that people could look to that would have, like be a, serve as a comprehensive database of all the trademarks. And so that it would be less likely that infringing marks would proliferate and everybody would benefit. And to do that, you have to attach a whole bunch of potent legal protections to it so that people have an incentive to go into the system and you want everyone to do that. And then you want you know, to register the marks that really track like what is a valid trademark. If it's a valid trademark, then you get then then you know you will register it. And in that way, it's a kind of pre-clearance mechanism too. And I think what is anomalous about this provision, and maybe slightly anomalous about the flags provision, is that. It actually disserves those purposes. If you're saying we have an otherwise valid mark that we're not going to register um, for some other reason, because then you're creating an increased likelihood of there being some infringing activity that would occur. And I think it's incumbent on the government to justify that. Now, on the flags provision, we thought a little bit about this because I thought it might come up. Um, 
And I think if intermediate scrutiny applies, I mean, the great thing about intermediate scrutiny is you know, the government has an opportunity to justify the law, but you just don't just assume that it's reasonable. So you might you take each provision on its own and, and, and you know, see what the government said. I've looked at section 1204 of the trademark you know, examining manual. And you know, there are some pretty fine distinctions that are drawn there between the kind of flag visuals that are deemed acceptable uh, to register and, and the ones that are not. And maybe that means the government interest in sort of ensuring that like flags that actually are rectangles, but it's okay if it's a trial, like that is enough of an interest to, to restrict that speech. Or maybe conversely, you could say, what's someone's like First Amendment interest in even if you can communicate the same kind of message and have almost the same artistic design, but just you can't reproduce the flag, like that's a pretty minimal interest. You get to express your message. That feels like that provision could go either way. Maybe there's a couple of as applied challenges, but I think it's facially constitutional. Whereas with the names clause, you really can't criticize someone without bringing them to mind. And the minute you bring them to mind, as you were mentioning, you're barred. And so it really does work categorically to ensure that on our on trademarks, on registered marks, you're not going to be able to engage in critical speech about public figures. And that, to me, is more. Well, wait, wait, wait. You can't engage in critical. Your client can engage in critical speech about Trump on printing on t-shirts and hasn't done it in the last five years since he said he intended to do so. So why does he want to mark? So if you go to trump2small.com, you'll see he sells the t-shirt. Oh, he does. Mark. Cool. He not only his mark, it's his domain name, and he, he we had worked with him before on an appeal, and he contacted us when he got to the federal circuit. And so I shouldn't speak to, but you know, but I know he has big dreams about this catching on and becoming, you know, a, you know, a, okay, a company. And um, he's waiting to hear from the PTO, and now he's waiting to hear from the Supreme Court. And has he in fact sold them? Yes, he has, and he sold them in 2018 and 2020. You know. Okay, so my last question is, um, interesting things that you observed in oral argument today or, or um, takeaway ideas? I, I myself was quite surprised. Yeah, I mean, I think, well, the, the last uh, time we were together, the last panel, I said one of the um, important things to watch in this case would be the new justices on the court, because the court has changed a lot since TAM. There's four new justices that were not there for, for the TAM case. Um, and it seemed, for, and, you know, this case doesn't frankly strike me as all that ideological a case. You know, it was not totally obvious where these justices would, would fall on this issue just based on you know, what we know of their judicial philosophy so far, since this issue hasn't arisen yet um, in this court. And, you know, I'm, I'm not at all sure that if the court had its current composition, it would have decided the Tam case or the Brunetti case um, the same way that it did. The newer justices, um, despite all their various differences on other things, all seemed um, pretty skeptical of this provision. And, and at least seemingly for some reasons that are not so easy to square with um, the, the reasoning of the two different opinions in, in TAM. Um, so I think that, you know, you could see the court um, having a somewhat narrow, and this is consistent with Jack Daniels too, you know, having a somewhat narrower view of um, the purposes of trademark law. Uh, now, John would say, and I thought it was fairly persuasive, if you have a narrower view of the purposes of trademark law, well, that only, um, you know, that, that should help him in this case, because, uh, you know, this the, the statute is not connected to those narrower purposes. But I have a sense that, and this is something Paul alluded to, I have a sense that the court, um, you know, may have in the background felt like this is not the kind of thing that should be a trademark. It seems more like, uh, you know, just a slogan on a t-shirt. Um, but of course, that really goes to whether it functions as a trademark, not whether the names clause is constitutional. But uh, but I think that might have been in the, in the background to some extent. So I had, I noted two things in oral argument, and only one of them, only one that I'm going to mention uh, has direct bearing on why we're here. So the one that has direct bearing on why they're here, and I, I have it in my notes, and I'm looking quickly through the transcript, I haven't sort of figured out exactly where it happened. But there was some discussion that oral argument about the difference between putting Trump too small uh, on the front of the t-shirt 
and putting Trump too small or Elster Productions on the tag, mm -hmm. suggesting that it's that tag that source identifying, not what's on the face of it, which to me, I mean, it's, that's right to some extent. And it's in concert with what our concerns are about allowing a trademark that effectively limits the right of the public to put the slogan on a t-shirt. But it also struck me as totally at odds with what the court did in the Jack Daniels case, because the parody here wasn't on the tag, it was on the face of the uh, of the dog toys, um, where it seems to me the court was sort of looking at source identifying the source identifying character of, ma of, of a mark in a vastly overbroad way um, in order to justify its application, for example, to limit the, the dilution um, uh, statute. The, the two things that most stood out to me uh, at oral argument were um, throughout the day, and I also happened to be at argument yesterday because we did a report for uh, Pam Carlin in O'Connor Radcliffe, was the extent to which the justices seemed to be going out of their way to seem collegial with each other. Um, sort of referring back and forth and so-and-so said this and so-and-so said that in a very friendly way. And I wonder whether to some extent that's a reaction to the opprobrium that's been directed to some members of the court over certain things that need not be mentioned in this panel. Um, and uh, so that's number one. And the second was the wonderful tribute to Malcolm Stewart at the end of the argument. Um, where the Chief Justice sort of went out of his way to be extremely nice. I mean, it's not very often that people get to the 100 argument mark. It tends to be people in the SG's office, right? Larry Wallace still holds the record, I think. Um, but, um, I mean, and his closing reference was to the fact that he'd argued against Malcolm Stewart uh, 23 years ago. And I think he said something along the lines he said, of, I fell short by just I fell short of a unanimous vote for my client by nine votes. <laughs> <laughs> so complimenting, I mean, and it really sort of jumped out at me at this argument. What an extraordinary advocate Malcolm Stewart is, not only defending the government's position in this case, but being very careful to moderate his position uh, to be consistent with what the government's going to want to argue in other cases, which is a problem that not many other litigants have. I mean, if you're representing a big corporation, you have to worry about, about that to some extent, but the government has that in spades. And he was very careful. And it was just a pleasure to watch. I mean, it was a pleasure to watch John. I have to say, handling a very difficult situation, but it was a pleasure to watch Malcolm as well. <laughs> Maybe then he got it again. It's very true. Mm -hmm. yeah, it, I would just say, building off that, like it was just kind of an, a neat honor for me to be able to be there as he argued his 100th case. It's nice that we've now teamed up for 101 cases. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I guess I don't have a lot to add at this point, but one thing I would say that sort of responds to something you were saying earlier, Paul, there's a question from Justice Barrett. She has the hypothetical that, you know, what, what happened if, what if uh, former President Trump were to seek registration of this exact same mark? And, you know, you gave an example where you could just register the mark like in, in the domain name context, and that would be enough. But with trademarks, of course, you've got to use it to actually have the rights. And so your client didn't use it. He registered based on intent to use. You don't have to have you. No, but she's You're, talking, right. her, her hypothetical involved enforcement. Right. Right. That's right. And if you, I'll just to answer that. If you, My understanding is if you register based on intent to use, then you wait first for the PTO to tell you that you've satisfied the criteria, and then you have six months to show them proof of, of having used it, right? And so... So, so you sell the T-shirt for five hundred dollars a piece. Nobody's going to buy it. So, but you use it. Okay, so that we'll build that into Justice Barrett's hypothetical. So, let's say former President Trump, you know, basically in an effort to chill other people's speech, tries to take out all of these marks and sells enough of them on the side uh, to 
acquire the trademark rights and uh, to there, therefore allow him to be able to credibly claim on his trademark application that he uses them and to obtain the benefits of registration. Um, what, what happens then? Isn't that like a First Amendment problem? And that's fully, that's, and that's what he can do under the current statute. So if he did that tomorrow, then he would then have rights against my client, even though the government today admitted that he has full constitutional rights to sell his t-shirts, right? And so what Malcolm said to that is that, don't worry about those chilling effects because of what you said in Jack Daniels, right? It's only going to be like, it's only if the, 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 re, the, the mark is used as a source identifier in a way that's likely to confuse consumers that it would give rise to infringement liability. And but, you know, much of what happens in the trademark world doesn't happen in court. Right. No, it right. happens in demand letters uh, in which people are threatened with infringement actions and awards of damages and awards of multi large damages and awards of attorney fees. And most people, many people, cave in response to them. And much of my practice these days is helping people who have received completely outrageous demand letters. And unless they find a lawyer like me, they don't know that they have a good ability to resist it. Most, most people just fold. And that's the problem. Well, it's a, it, it's a problem that exists with the current statute. Right. And that's, the, that's why you don't want to allow the registration of marks like this, because it gives heightened remedies that can be then threatened. And enforcement threats. On your view, only the target of the speech should have those remedies and no one else. That seems to be more problematic. They don't, as a practical, yeah. right. as a practical matter, they're not going to do this. Right. <laughs> Let me say we're out of time, but um, but but yes, I, I I I absolutely agree with the with the, the larger point of your comment, which is um, the justices seem to be very sensitive to the idea of trademarks inhibiting speech in a way that we have not seen in the last two cases in their opinions or in oral argument questioning. And um, Justice Sotomayor went, went so far as to say, let's go back to first principles here um, and to make that point very clearly. So I think that's it. If we get that in opinion, our brief will have been worthwhile. <laughs> Um, so we're at time. We're beyond time. Um, I want to. I want to really. Uh, I want to thank the audience for coming and for your attention. And I want you to join me in thanking our wonderful panelists.